So that is the NWR Virtual Health Conference. It's May 2020. We hope you enjoyed your lunch. Sorry we couldn't supply it for you today as it is a virtual health conference, but we've got so much more ahead to come. Next up, we have Volpara Health Technologies. Volpara Health Technologies is a medtech software as a service company founded in 2009 on research originally conducted at Oxford University. VHT's clinical functions for screening clinics provide feedback on breast density, compression, dose, and quality, while its enterprise-wide practice software management helps with productivity, compliance, reimbursement, and patient tracking. We have Dr. Ralph Heinem on the line with us today. Ralph is a founding director of VHT. He has been at the forefront of the digital breast imaging field for over 25 years. As CEO, Ralph is dedicated to providing the most accurate measurements possible of breast composition in order to improve the health outcomes of women around the world. Volpara is based in Wellington, New Zealand, and Ralph is joining us from there now for a slightly different format for this one, if you've been watching so far today. Ralph and I will be doing a little bit more um, back and forth with questions throughout. And of course, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them through in the chat function and we'll get onto them during the presentation or at the end. You can take it away, Ralph. Cool. Thank you, Laura, and uh, welcome everyone. And thank you for your uh, in interest today. So look, uh, Volpara is a software company based in Wellington, and you can see Wellington over, over my shoulder here. We, uh, we started in 2009, we're a software as a service company applying AI to breast x-rays to help the early detection of breast cancer. We, uh, we provide a range of tools for clinical decision support and practice management, and, and really the aim of our software is to help cost-effective reduction of breast cancer deaths, and that those deaths number in, in, in the hundreds of thousands uh, globally each year. And for much of my life, uh, since my PhD in Oxford, I've been dedicated to driving that number down uh, as far as we go. Breast cancer screening is a big opportunity. The um, 92 million women are screened globally, around 50% of those are in the US. We have a great product suite, which we'll talk about in a, in a minute, which we believe we can sell up to $10 or up or so. So we believe the total opportunity is around US 750 million. Oh, that's a pretty big, sorry, sorry I have to jump in, that's a pretty big opportunity and you do point out your competitive moat. Could you maybe talk us through that a little bit more and just talk about how you're actually differentiated in terms of your, um, of your first mover advantage, which is, which is interesting considering you're a New Zealand company. Yep, so Laura, we, yeah, we are a New Zealand company, but yeah, I did my PhD at the University of Oxford from day one we were born global. The founders of the company were from the University of Toronto, University of Nijmegen, University of Oxford and, and myself. We were set up in Wellington, New Zealand because the uh, government was very supportive and the quality of the people we, we could get here to work for us was, was exceptional. That's kind of why we're in New Zealand, but we're very much a born global company from day one. Uh, because of our background, we have a huge amount of experience and since 2009 have filed a whole series of patents uh, we have over 300 papers now um, describing the clinical validation of what we do. We have a full range of products and regulatory clearances and the ability to scale, you know, you know, none of which our competition has. So we're in a very strong position with that competitive moat around us. Okay. Thanks for that. Yeah, that's good to hear. And obviously the US market, um, you know, that's the big market for, for most biotechs. Um, and I can see the numbers on the screen there, 30 million, 39 million screenings per annum over there. How is the company doing around the world with sales uh, outside of the US? Yeah, so we, um, we're, we're active in 38 countries around the world, but the US is our biggest market. The US is always the early adopter for new medical technologies. Um, so. That's our focus and we've got 20% of US women have uh, at least um, one of our products being applied to their images uh, every year when they come for screening. Uh, outside the US, to, to your question, we, we have a good foothold now in Australia and New Zealand and we have big trials underway in Holland, Norway, uh, the UK and elsewhere around Europe. And then we, we have most of the top luminaries uh, in, in Asia at the moment. But our focus as a company very much is US, Australia, New Zealand. 
Has COVID impacted screening in, in those markets? Uh, yep, it certainly has done. So screening has mostly temporarily stopped now. However, unlike other industries, yeah, breast cancer screening, uh, if you stop it too long, uh, obviously you do end up uh, with many more women coming through with advanced breast cancers and therefore increased mortality and therefore uh, increased costs as well. So although it's not classed as an essential service, we, we do see it as a critical service. And uh, certainly politicians around the world are calling this out as a critical service, which they need to get restarted. So Scott Morrison uh, did announce, uh, I think it was last week, that breast cancer screening will restart in Australia this week. And so that's the way it's going here in New Zealand as well. In the US, it's a bit more um, on and off. Uh, in New York, screening stopped, and it's not clear when it starts again. But in the Midwest, um, you know, you know, screening uh, does appear to be starting back up and we're starting to see volumes ramp back up uh, in those sites. Thanks for that. I might, I might let you take it away with um, the outlook to come on that first slide that you put up there. Yeah, so look, you know, we have 27% of the, the US market. We have the annual occurring revenue now. We, we actually beat our target and then beat, beat the new one we gave out. Uh, Post-raise, we have plenty of cash in the bank. We'll come back to some of those numbers uh, in a minute. Uh, COVID certainly is impacting um, screening, but as I said, you know, we, we are seeing it restart now, Australia, New Zealand, parts of the US. But one of the key things we're, we're telling people at the moment is, is how resilient we are as a company. You know, it's a beautiful picture behind me, that's Wellington. Wellington is a beautiful place because of earthquakes. It raises all the hills. So from a start, we've been a very resilient company. Uh, we've been cloud-based, we've been remote working. So working from home is, to is, to is, is totally kind of what we do day to day anyway. Um, the business model we do is uh, annually paid upfront and that's proved to be very resilient. Our cash collection in Q4, which was the end of March, was excellent. And uh, we're, we're seeing no signs so far of any reduction in, uh, in payments uh, in, in April, which is our Q1. So the whole business model of people paying up, up front um, for a year uh, looks to be like a resilient model. Uh, we, we also have then, in, in terms of resilience, we have an excellent US team. And again, going forward, having an excellent Australian New Zealand team and a US team very close, closely integrated with excellent networks and well-established leads uh, is going to be very important for us and, and indeed I think all companies because you know, we, we ain't going to be flying back and forth to the US for a while. Uh, and then fourth, uh, the fifth point down there, and, and really the purpose of the capital raise was, although we had lots of money in the bank, we started to see opportunities come to us with companies with far less robust structures and finances uh, ask, asking effectively for help. We, uh, so we did the capital raise, or we're underway now with the capital raise. Strength of the balance sheet, but also then be in a position to really aggressively pursue the identified M&A opportunities as they arise. And all those opportunities are companies that we've known Laura for many years, and they all have the great opportunity to uh, increase our market share in the US and or ARPU, which is critical to us as a SaaS company. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you could talk us through the numbers, I understand your financial year has just ended. So interesting to say that. Yep. So obviously, you know, um, cash reserves are quite, quite strong, as you were saying, that gives you, um, that gives you ammo, I guess, to potentially to potentially um, engage in M&A activity. Um, then maybe yep. if you could provide more context for us, Ralph, that would be great. Yep. So I'll just note some of the numbers. The 4C came out end of uh, a couple of weeks ago and, yeah, showed another strong quarter of cash in. And remember, you know, a lot of March, coronavirus was very strong across the US, so cash received in was fully in line with expectations. And again, April has been very strong as well. The um, yeah, net cash burn, so, so we had uh, over two years of cash before we did this capital raise. We're obviously in a very strong position now cash-wise uh, to conduct some of the M&A, and we'll come back to that uh, in a minute. The uh, financial year results come out at the end of uh, May, so it's a couple of weeks away. These are the non-audited numbers. So the annualized revenue, a uh, non-GAAP um, would be around 18 million, but uh, yeah, the, the non-GAAP revenue, um, excluding MRS that were acquired in June will be around 16 million, and then uh, so on down the, down the road there with some technical uh, numbers coming out. 
BL Aurea, we're in a very strong position cash wise. Uh, cash collection continues to be very strong and we're in a great position now to, to go after some of the M&A opportunities. Thanks, Ralph. Um, maybe the next slide, I believe, you know, you're talking about your growth across all your different metrics. Um, it's interesting to see uh, the growth in the screening um, over in the US. What do, you, what do you attribute that growth in screening to? How does the software perhaps get integrated into radiology clinics Maybe if you can give us a bit more about how your integrations work in the US healthcare system specifically. Yeah, so let's talk about integration. That's a question that investors often ask, Laura. Uh, the integration in our case is, is actually very simple. We, uh, we, we usually install a virtual machine at a site and then we'll log in remotely and set the software up. And nowadays as well, we do remote, uh, in, you know, entirely remote installation then remote training and remote support afterwards. So uh, literally you set up a computer, you go to an X-ray machine, say send X-ray images to Volpara, and then Vol you make Volpara send out the results to their archiving systems uh, and up into the cloud. The graphs do show, Laura, as you say, uh, very strong growth uh, year on year. And I will just mention then the percentage of women screened is 40 million women a year. So at the moment we are helping 10 million women a year get, get uh, better screening results over there uh, in the US. Those sales and in the US are being driven by two things. One is our software is being proven to help patients. <clears throat> That's always the, uh, always the first key um, discussion point with radiologists. Yeah, we can show how our software leads to better breast compression, better image quality, right the way through to improved cancer detection. But then the other side of it, uh, which is key in the US, is also then showing a good return on investment. So our shot software now, we have plenty of uh, use cases and business cases showing how, for example, we can help drive down the cost of audits. We can help drive down the number of uh, women that get recalled unnecessarily for extra imaging uh, and, and so on. So, is that, so you know, the growth there has been driven by that two things. One, proven, proven uh, customer care and two, a good return on investment story for the US. The, the other number, Laura, just um, up there on the left-hand side, that uh, 25 million then, that's, so it's 25 million mammograms have flowed up into the cloud. We are a very uh, innovative company. We spend a lot on R&D. We're gonna keep spending on R&D because uh, we believe in keeping well ahead of any competitor. That is simply an amazing data set to have. Uh, for product development. Yeah, and your, your software, from my research, I understand it to be multifaceted or multi pronged whatever you want to call it, where you're scanning for things such as density um, and risk. And this is this seems to be quite set apart from your competitors. It'd be interesting to hear a little bit more from you about what density is in particular um, and what that actually means in this context. Because I, I haven't heard of that, I haven't heard of that specifically um, out of many of the competitors. Yep. So my PhD in the 1990s was the first uh, first PhD in the world, really, to show how to automate the computation of breast density. Uh, we didn't know it at the time. We didn't realise how important it was going to be, but the world has caught up now, Laura. So yeah, if you look down here at uh, these images. This is a, th 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 these are two top-down views of the breast. They're called craniocaudal views. The black tissue here, you should be able to see my mouse, is, is fatty tissue. And the white is dense tissue. So this is what they call quite a fatty breast. Uh, whereas over here, this is what you call a dense breast. There's lots of white tissue. Uh, cancer starts in, in dense tissue or in glandular tissue. So the woman on the right here has got much higher probability that she's going to actually develop breast cancer in the first place. But there's a double whammy for her. If a cancer forms and, and the little star there is meant to be a cancer, it's much harder to see on the dense background than it is on the, on the fatty background. Okay. This was known about in the 1970s, but it's taken 50 years or so for the world really to get up to speed on it and uh, for accurate ways of measuring it and so on to come through to market. And, and Volpara really is the world leader uh, in that. It's got to the point now where most states in the US legislate that breast density is so important for women that women should be told it. 
and the FDA by October this year, uh, we expect them to come out with a mandate that all women in the US should be told their breast density as well. Obviously that's gonna drive a huge amount of interest in our breast density offerings. What's the likelihood that Australian authorities or other um, health authorities around the world will then mandate that kind of breast reporting as well? Yeah, a lot of the countries outside the US have been waiting for a randomised controlled trial uh, to come out. Um, one came out in December from the Dutch uh, using our software and it was a very powerful endorsement for density based screenings. They uh, dramatically decreased the number of interval cancers, which are the cancers where the woman feels a lump in the breast, so they're already quite advanced uh, and they might have spread. So that trial showed a really significant reduction in interval cancers. Um, given that then screening programs around the world have started talking to us more actively and in late December we got our first deal with a public screening program to report density and do quality assessment for them. Now coronavirus has put back their public announcement about that uh, but uh, they are starting up again now so we do expect that to come online and for that public screening program to make an announcement over the next uh, few months or so. Just looking at that bottom point there, um, the grant of patents and trademarks for your technology, could you go into a little bit more detail about that for, for people watching at home, um, where you actually, a bit more about your intellectual property overall and where you hold your patents? Yeah, so a lot of our patents um, are, oh, here you go, I'm going to go, move on here. These are, this is an x-ray machine. An x-ray machine can be made by many manufacturers, Hologic, GE, Siemens, Fuji, uh, Philips, and so on. A lot of our patents and the, the concepts of breast density measurement, accurate breast density measurement were worked out in the 1990s by myself in Oxford. But making it work reliably on any x-ray machine anywhere in the world is really what our key IP is all around. So the patents we filed uh, when we started the company in 2009 were how, were how to make uh, the software robust to, to whatever the world could throw at it. And there, there was a real bellwether moment for us when in 2014, uh, we installed into Karachi. The image quality was poor. The, um, the machine was about 20 years old, but the software in terms of the breast density estimation worked perfectly. So that really kind of you know, gives you an indication of the strength of our, of our IP. Now people have tried to come into this space, the x-ray vendors have tried to come into this space. They tend to make fantastic uh, hardware, but uh, so far we're not seeing a lot of traction for them in their software tools, such as their breast density tools. So Laura, just um, on this slide, then let's just step through this. So this is a, a this is what we launched in December last year. So we brought a company called MRS in June last year and we launched a fully integrated software platform in December. So the woman walks in, she fills out her patient details. X-rays are done, they come down to Valpara Live. It says good image or bad image. If it's a good image, she can go home. If it's a bad image, they can retake the image while she's there. These good high quality images now flow to the radiologist and they do so then uh, with a Volpara scorecard showing the density, which is a D here for extremely dense. There's a lifetime risk score on there, and there's some computer aided detection marks on there as well. Uh, we announced a couple of weeks ago a partnership with Ambry, which is a big genetics company, to then link uh, this all the way through to a letter that can then go off to a genetic counselor to say, this woman is high risk, um, you might want to do genetics counseling on her. So, so if, um, sorry, Ralph, to jump in, but if the patient is then classified as high risk and the data is passed on to Ambry at that point, what's the average revenue per user there? Just so we can get a bit more of an understanding of the commercials at that point. Yep, we uh, estimate the ARPU for that um, is going to be between one and two dollars per woman uh, from that deal of Ambry. And, and the key to success in that deal is successful clinical implementation and making the whole thing very smooth, very electronic and, and painless for the woman, the site and the genetics companies. And we believe by offering the complete platform, uh, we're, we're in a great position to do that. So now this is our clinical decision support tools, but the data then flows up into our patient tracking system, Aspen, 
and enterprise, which is our um, standalone quality assurance uh, platform. Mm -hmm. um, just going back to ARPU, you know, the average ARPU we get at the moment is just over US $1. But um, most sites only have one, uh, one of our products, i.e., for example, Aspen Breast. The average deal size, or the average new deal size in Q4 was $1.45 to $3. So clearly already people are buying software from us at much higher ARPU than the average. So as we really focus over the next few quarters on the install base, uh, we can expect to see that ARPU really starting to, to ramp up uh, nicely. Looking at um, the Volpara Enterprise on the right there, that's not a, that may not need to be a breast specific product in the future. And Peter Checkley has um, asked a question, He's wondering if there are any other areas you could develop additional products using your IP, um, so outside of breast screening even, and if you have any plans, do you harbour any plans to do that in the future? Yep, no, we, we certainly do. I mean, breast cancer screening is, is, is a big market. Um, one of the things we've learned as a company is you want to focus. However, when we brought Aspen last year from MRS, part of that came with 10% of the lung cancer screening market. So we're already heavily involved in patient tracking for lung cancer. Uh, we are ramping that up now to cover coronavirus and COVID-19 as well with various templates. But a lot of what you see on the screen there, if you replace the x-ray machine by a CT scanner, um, you know, when, you, when you do lung cancer CT scanning, for example, there's still quality issues. So Virgil Live for lung CT, uh, Volpar Enterprise for lung cancer, tracking radiation, dose and so on. They're all very viable. But uh, as, a, as a company, we, uh, we need to keep focused. And our focus over the next six months is, is lung and patient tracking for, sorry, is breast and patient tracking for lung and patient tracking for uh, COVID-19. Thanks for that, Pete. Thanks for that, Ralph. Um, you can move on to the next slide. I guess we've covered all that quite well. Cool. Uh, yeah, so Laura, look, yeah, we talked a lot about ARPU. We want to get to $10 ARPU. Each of these products basically sits around $2. Um, so yeah, if you add them, if a site, uh, if our ideal site brought them all, we'd get towards $15 or ARPU. But obviously there'll be big discounts coming in uh, if people buy them all. So we are, we are, we are hopeful in the US to get into that $10. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a process. But in three or four years time, if we get towards three or $4, and uh, if we can get towards helping 15, 20 million women a year get screened in the US, I think we'll be in a very, very strong position. I think uh, worth noting again, right, our ARR model is proven to be very resilient. Most breast imaging sites are saying to us that we're going to pay because it's fully in our expectation that we're going to catch up the number of women that uh, we've missed over the last couple of months. We're going to catch those up over the next year because breast cancer screening is critical. You want to catch cancers early, and we do not want to be a site that catches cancers later. So historically, uh, it looks like the product was sold as a standalone, as capital, and now you've moved into more of like a software, well, you have moved into a software as a service solution. But what, what about if, you know, the user only wants the density product or um, one of the products? Is there still an option for them to only buy one, not the suite of, of products? Uh, no, you certainly can buy them all, but in the US it's still SaaS. Uh, we still do, we, we do do a few capital sales in Asia. Australia, New Zealand and the US is now almost entirely SaaS. But yeah, there'll, there'll be one or two odd deals we do up in Asia where the distributors and, and so on just don't know how to deal with software as a service. Mm -hmm. But on the whole, um, it's all SaaS now. But certainly, yeah, you can buy density, although most, most sites now buy enterprise and density. But the deals we're seeing come through now are much more combined deals where they're buying Aspen, density and enterprise. Those are the ones that could be, the, are really going to show a big uptick in ARPU. And they're the ones that are really starting to flow through now, given we launched the SaaS pricing 1st of December last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the SaaS, the SaaS uh, solution, obviously, the software service solution is going quite well. And we can see that in the, in the US market, which you've got up on the screen there, with uh, where you've actually got the, the screening capabilities across the US, which is your major focus. 
Yep, and you know, a couple of key points here, right? One, we've got great geographical spread now. Two, we've got an outstanding US sales team with, with uh, outstanding relationships. One of the things we are doing a lot of this company now is you know, we, we it's a new world, right? So these, these salespeople uh, have to do a lot more remote selling, for example. And you know, one of the things we've found is much easier to do remote selling if you already have the relationships. So that sales team, absolutely vital to us going forward uh, during this coronavirus um, outbreak. Um, yeah, and I'll just point again, you know, outstanding customers, Laura down there, MD Anderson, MSK, some of the biggest uh, and best uh, cancer centers in the US. And as we indicated earlier, the FDA is really focusing on quality, but also we expect before October for them to come out with some breast density legislation as well which is going to put a lot more focus on accurate and reliable breast density scores, an area in which we are the leader. Thanks for that, Raul. Maybe if you could move on to the next slide and, and show us what's happening outside of the US there. Yep, so as we said, you know, we are present across the world. Yeah, we've made a strategic decision this, this year to keep Asia and Europe warm, but we think they're going to take a long time to come out of coronavirus. So our big focus is Australia and New Zealand, where, as I said earlier, New Zealand's just had zero coronavirus cases to date. New Zealand's well on the way to dealing with it and screening will start back up. So we're very positive and bullish about New Zealand and Australia. And we retain our sales team in the US remain very bullish about the year ahead uh, over there. But yeah, so we're going to keep active. We've got some excellent uh, customers over there in, in Australia. And as we indicated earlier, we did have the first major public screening sign up. That's been delayed slightly going live because of coronavirus, but we do expect that over the next few months to come out and announce as well. Mm -hmm. So in Australia, I can notice, uh, Odair, that you've got some big names um, as partners, such as you know, Royal Melbourne Hospital. So there'd be conversations, ind individual conversations going on with each of the hospitals around, um, around Australia then. Yep. Uh, we, we, yeah, yeah we, we've got uh, salespeople in Brisbane and uh, Melbourne. They obviously can go into these sites. Again, they've got very well established relationships with those sites. Um, so yeah, that, that's how we do the sales. But also obviously we're targeting the big chains as well, like IMED, but also the public screening programs, uh, you know, which you have to do in Australia on a state by state basis. So yeah, there's plenty of opportunity uh, in Australia. And we're looking forward very much to the year ahead. Outside, though, of you know what's going on at the moment with Corona, um, do you have any? What would you identify as your biggest challenges for the business? We've heard a lot about the opportunities, but we do have a question asking: What are the challenges for the business going forward? It, you've got a, a big addressable market there, and um, there's a lot of opportunities on the cards. But if we could just hone into that potentially. Yeah. So we'll just just in terms of challenges. Um, I think if we, oh, here you go, let's go on to this one. I think, yeah, obviously coronavirus is a challenge, but one of the things that we've gone, you know, one of the things which we were told very early on, you have to recognize the world has changed uh, and you have to act on it. So we are acting on that uh, by, by not focusing so much on Europe, uh, Australia. We've done some, um, some uh, removal of costs as well, because cash is king in these kind of environments without damaging our opportunities for growth. Um, and, and we're very focused then onto the US and, and Australia and New Zealand. Uh, challenges then, obviously competition, but as per point two there, you know, we need to keep innovating. We have an amazing data set. We have an outstanding engineering team here uh, in Wellington, and we need to keep on uh, innovating. Uh, competition uh, will come and we shouldn't be naive about that, so we need to uh, keep ahead of it. There are gonna be challenges about being in Australia and New Zealand and our big market in the US under coronavirus, but we're doing lots of work now to uh, ensure that the teams are fully integrated on a day-by-day -day basis uh, and working very smoothly um, through that. Um, another challenge is the ability to scale, but again, as per point four on there points out, uh, one of our strategic initiatives this year is partnering to scale. We already worked closely with GE. Now we're working closely with Ambry Genetics and we're looking for further big partners to come in and really help us scale. But Laura, I realize the time's moving on a bit. 
Um, yeah, with coronavirus, obviously it's a risk, there's challenges, but also there's massive opportunities for us. Mm. There's companies out there um, yeah, based outside the US who, who haven't got any salespeople in the US who, who've got no opportunity to sell now in the US because they can't fly there. There's other companies we know that have got software as a service models based on pay-per-click where they're getting no clicks. So they're dead, you've got real cash flow issues. Yeah, with a capital raise, we, we are now positioned very strongly to take advantage of those. And obviously, as we take advantage of those, we'll increase market share, increase ARPU, but also then decrease our overall risk from competition and, and so on coming into the game. Yeah, I'm conscious, Ralph, that we are running out of time, as you pointed out too. I've got two more questions for you. I think you can answer them quite quickly. Um, someone has asked, while you've been speaking, can you see breast density screening as an annual test that your GP will recommend for all adult women, you know, like a blood test? Uh, absolutely. Um, it's not going to happen overnight, but you know, the, the way breast density is going and going back to innovation point, uh, we're going to start monitoring breast density over time. So if you go onto HRT, for example, your GP will say, we're going to measure breast density and make sure hormone replacement therapy isn't increasing your density. Um, if you are high risk, you're going to go on drugs like tamoxifen. And when you have tamoxifen, they'll measure breast density to make sure tamoxifen is reducing your risk. So I do see it absolutely going that way. And I see you've laid out um, FY 2021 quite nicely, five key points there. Um, when I have to ask, so when will we find out more about your first major screening program? That, that sticks out to me. Yep, so they are starting up again now. Um, so as soon as they get live, as soon as they get their kind of ducks in a row to announce it, um, that'll be coming out. It was meant to be in March. Uh, at this point, you know, we expect it to be between three, three and six months from where we are today. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Ralph. If there's anything else you want to add just to wrap up, um, feel free to. And any questions we haven't gotten around to answering that have come through? We're happy to answer by email, of course, so anyone can have their question answered um, after this. Yep. No, thank, thanks, Laura. Thanks for the, uh, the, the interview style. The, thanks for the time, everyone. Look, uh, you can email us and we will answer questions. We like to be very transparent in how we deal with shareholders. Obviously, we're into the SPP now. Uh, the institutions uh, came in heavily and are now, but we want to give the opportunity to our uh, current existing shareholders to participate uh, as well. So feel free to ask us uh, more questions. Coronavirus is going to have an impact, but so far we look to be a very resilient company, a very resilient business model uh, in, in a very resilient uh, industry. So we're very much looking forward to quarters ahead, but especially once those quarters uh, start to come out of uh, coronavirus as well. Thanks, Ralph. Best of luck in the future. Cool. Thank you, Laura. Thanks. We'll be back with more in a couple of minutes' time. We'll, of course, be back with Respiry, which is a, an e-health software-as-a-service company. Stay on the line. We'll see you soon.